If you pull up chapter 10 in your book, we start at respiratory management, which is right after the principles of pharmacology. I'm also pulling stuff from chapter 12. We're not going to do an entire chapter 12 lecture. We're just going to pull the drugs from chapter 12 that we need to discuss. And today we are discussing respiratory drugs. What drugs do you use for respiratory management? Antihistamines. Antihistamines, like what? Uh, Benadryl. Benadryl. Brian? Albuterol. Albuterol. What do we use albuterol for? Bronchodilation. To help with bronchodilation. All right, what other drugs do we use for respiratory management? Uh, Epinephrine. Oxygen. Atrovent. I know, what is it? I know. That's the atrovent. Uh, okay. The big long I word? Yeah. Atrovent. Okay. What else? What about your RSI drugs? Sucks. Atomidate. Succedylcholine. Atomidate. Fentanyl. Fentanyl. Use Decaronium. Rocaronium. Does everybody got one? Oh, God. Based out on the evening. Yeah, I don't know. You said one more time. Sorry. All right, so when you're dealing with the respiratory system, everybody remember your maximum pathophysiology, your lungs bronchial tree, trachea, all those wonderful things. Do we need to go back over this? You shouldn't have to, should we? All right. Does include all the structures involved in oxygen exchange and carbon dioxide exchange. Emergencies involving respiratory system usually are caused by reversible conditions, such as asthma, emphysema with infection, and foreign body airway obstruction. Which reversible condition is common among pediatric patients? Don't answer aloud, use your clicker. We should have 26. Which reversible condition is common among pediatric patients? Can I go ahead and tell you right now, I don't use a lot of the notes from the book. I use my own notes composed over the last couple of semesters that I've taught pharmacology. So it does kind of go a little backwards in your book if you're trying to get where you are right now. It does kind of go a little bit backwards, and I apologize for that. There's one person left. For whatever reason, I'm not sure. <laughs> she would be 26. She would be 27 and she would be 28. So there's, actually, there's 26 people. Hey, the clicker doesn't work. So how about that? You need another one? No. <laughs> no. All right, we're going to stop there. Which reversible condition is common among your pediatric patients? What's the correct answer? Foreign body airway obstruction. Foreign body airway obstruction. Why is that? Because it's reversible. It helped. Or because they put everything in their mouth, don't they? Yes. Pediatric patients like to throw things in their mouth, especially at toddler age. They're picking things up and putting them right in their mouth. All right, talking about the respiratory system drugs, we're going to talk about these here in just a few minutes. And just a little more patho for you. Smooth muscle fibers do line the tracheal tree. I already know that. The parasympathetic fibers from the vagus nerve stimulate the bronchial smooth muscle through the release of acetylcholine. So the smooth muscle is stimulated by the release of neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. Do I care that you know that? No, it's just a little pathway for you to read. Okay, I'm not going to ask you if you want that on the test. What is epinephrine? Does it naturally occur in your body? Yes. It is a naturally occurring bronchodilator in your body, right? Yes. <coughs> the first set of drugs we're going to talk about are bronchodilators. So what's one that comes to mind? Albuterol. Albuterol is used for... Most patients have asthma, COPD, emphysema, anybody that is wheezing, right? Mm -hmm. You give pretty much albuterol to anybody that's wheezing. And what is wheezing caused from? Restriction. Constriction of the airway. Constriction of the upper airway or the lower airway? Upper. Oh. Upper airway or the lower airway? Oh. Lower airway. If you have obstruction or constriction of the upper airway, what breath sound are you going to hear? Strider. Strider. What does strider sound like? <laughs> Very high-pitched, sounds like a very high-pitched whistle <laughs> wheeze. What was that? <laughs> that was your imitation <laughs> of Strider? <laughs> <laughs> what respiratory 
condition can you come into contact where a patient would have strider? Especially pediatric patients. Say they're drooling, they have a high fever. Epiglottitis. Epiglottitis, they would have that strider sound. Also, patients who have chronic bronchitis, asthma, and emphysema will be using bronchodilators. What is chronic bronchitis? Inflammation of the bronchi. Bronchitis, you always have it. It's a chronic condition. These patients produce a lot of mucus, right? They produce a ton of mucus. We like to call chronic bronchitis patients blue bloaters. We'll learn about that in medical emergencies next semester, too. We call them blue bloaters because they're always blue. They're never a pretty pink color. They're always blue. And they're usually bigger people. They're not teeny tiny little people. As opposed to emphysema, we call them the pink puffers. Their cheeks are usually rosy pink. They puff when they breathe, like that. And they're usually very thin and emaciated looking. Bronchodilators are classified as sympathomimetic drugs. It's a big, long word, isn't it? Sympathomimetic. Now, you have your sympathetic nervous system and your parasympathetic nervous system, right? Mm -hmm. What's your parasympathetic nervous system? your rest and relaxation or your feed and breathe, right? That's whenever you're calm, cool, collected, you want to eat, do other relaxation things. All right, and what about your sympathetic nervous system? That's your fight or flight. So if someone's to run here and say the building's on fire, which would kick in? Your parasympathetic or your sympathetic? sympathetic. Your sympathetic nervous system, right? So what would happen to your body? Start to freak out. You freak out, right? You breathe fast, your blood pressure would go up, your heart rate would go up, you'd be extremely anxious, maybe you start sweating, right? Pupils dilate, your guts don't even think about moving because you're not going to go poop and you're definitely not going to be ready to eat. You're going to be ready to get the heck out of Dodge, right? <laughs> well, no, sometimes you might. <laughs> All right, well, your bronchodilators work like your sympathetic nervous system, thus they're called sympathomimetic. This mimetic word back here means mimic. It mimics the sympathetic nervous system. So when somebody takes an albuterol hit, how do they feel? Anxious. Tachycardic. Right? Does it affect your heart rate? So one of the big things about atropine is that it increases your heart rate. So that's one thing to know about bronchodilators is they have that sympathetic nervous system sensation. They do mimic the sympathetic nervous system. All right, we also have your beta agonist medications. They are the primary treatment for bronchospasm. They do cause muscle relaxation and bronchodilation, which is what they're supposed to do, right? You have two different types. You have your selective, which selectively targets your beta-2 receptor sites, and your non-selective, which doesn't care. It targets 1 and 2. What's the difference between 1 and 2? One's, one's, one's the heart, one's lungs. Which one's the heart? One. Beta 1's the heart, beta 2's the one. lungs. So if it's a selective bronchodilator, then it only targets the one. lungs. If it's non-selective, then it targets one. everything, right? Albuterol is a selective beta-2 agonist, has a very minimal effect on beta-1, which is why it's considered a selective. It does increase the heart rate, but that's about all it does. Which to me is just an oxymoron. To me, I would think it is a non-selective because it does both 1 and 2. So according to your book, it's selective. You can't see that. Also, new family members. New family members would cause the sympathetic nervous system <laughs> influx, right? Yes, it would. Yeah. All right, this drug is used in the treatment of bronchoconstriction. It can also aid in the treatment of hyperkalemia. As a short-term goal, it can treat hyperkalemia until another treatment is found or used. Which drug is this? Atrovent, albuterol, epinephrine, or Benadryl? Helps with bronchodilation. That's used in bronchoconstriction. It can also be used to help treat hyperkalemia.
have more responses, you're going to be a little bit quicker. Not for gray. What do you think? This is a new one for me. I did not know this drug did this. I thought it was pretty interesting when I read it. It's a little fun fact for you. You learn lots of little fun facts in pharmacology. All right, we're going to go ahead. Ooh, look at that. That's pretty. It is pretty. It's staircase. All the way down. All right, so 41% of you said Atrovent. All right, 32% said albuterol, 23% said epinephrine, and 5% said Benadryl. The correct answer is albuterol. Oh. Albuterol helps to pull potassium out of the cell. So it helps whenever you are hyperkalemic. Hyperkalemic, you've got too much potassium in the cell, right? And it needs to be pulled out. And albuterol is one of those drugs that can help pull it out. It only lasts for a short amount of time, so you've got to get another treatment in place. Hyperkalemia is one of those things that can be treated with many different drugs. Albuterol is just one of them. Also can be treated with insulin and dextrose and calcium too, I believe. All right, any questions? That's a nice little fun fact for you. What happens when you have too much potassium in your body? Your heart stops. It can affect your heart, right? Because you have dysrhythmias, very big peak T waves. Another respiratory drug is Atrovin. I can never say that I word. I don't know why. Who can pronounce that? Ipatronium. I, I can't say it. I'm too country. It's Atrovin. <laughs> I like atrovent. I cannot say that big long I word. Okay? It does cause bronchodilation and decrease mucus in the upper airways. So it helps to cut down on the mucus production. How many times can the paramedic administer this in the field to one patient? Usually you can only administer this once because it's a drug that can be given every six to eight hours. It is not a drug like albuterol. Albuterol you can give it how many ever how many minutes? And ever like fifteen minutes? Atrovent can only be given once by a medic in the field to one patient. It's only administered every six to eight hours. Atrovent inhibits the interaction of acetylcholine at the receptor sites of the bronchial smooth muscle. So what does acetylcholine do? Remember that back to that beginning slide? It's a sympathetic neurotransmitter that is released in the body to cause <laughs> Helps with relaxation. All right, it is indicated for persistent bronchiospasm or COPD exacerbation. What is COPD exacerbation? The flare up of COPD. A patient who has COPD has a ton of mucus production and they have a lot of coughing, right? Difficulty breathing. Helps with that. Contraindications, of course, hypersensitivity is always a contraindication on any drug that you give. Atropine is also a contraindication in peanuts. Hmm. Kind of interesting, peanuts. Why peanuts? I honestly have no idea. So they're allergic to peanuts? They're allergic to peanuts, they not take atropine. Probably maybe peanut brewery. Maybe. I'm not sure why that is. It is a category B, so what does that mean? Is it safe or not safe for a pregnant woman? Safe. So pregnancy categories A and B are pretty safe for a pregnant woman, right? C? What about C? C is an C is an iffy, right? D is a definite iffy. And X is a no. X is always a no, right? C and D are if the benefits outweigh the risks. So if it would save that mother's life to give it to her, then give it to her. Just so you know, there's no life-saving medication that's a category X. Category C and D are life-saving medicines, like atropine, um, epinephrine, drugs like that. Always make sure you shake it before you use it. Just like any other medication that you give, like I've you always shake it before you give it. Really? Yeah. Never do that. Always shake it. Things can, what's it called? Settle. Settle. Settle, thank you. Oh, I'll always shake it. Always shaking. Always. <laughs> Alright, corticosteroids. Do you think you administer these in the field? No. No, not only ambulance services carry corticosteroids. Mostly given in the hospital setting for patients who have bronchoconstriction and need some help with dilation. <coughs> Cytomedrol is probably one of the most common that you'll see given in the hospital setting. If you have somebody with asthma or somebody with COPD who's having difficulty breathing, they're wheezing, you give them the albuterol treatment, it does help, brain oxygen level up. When they get to the hospital, they're going to need a steroid. What do these steroids do? 
they decrease the inflammation because you're constricted, everything's inflamed in your lungs, right? Your bronchial tree, everything's inflamed. So in order to deflame it, you gotta give a steroid. Steroids help to decrease that inflammation. There's also mucokinetic drugs. These help move secretions along in the airway. So what your atrovent does. Atrovent is considered a mucokinetic drug. It helps to move the mucus out. Does it just like dry you up kind of thing? It dries you up. Move it out. Get it all out. Helps you to be able to let the mucus come out, be able to cough it out. So, so would that be like the Bucinex and stuff too? You know, the Bucinex is... It's an expectorant. Yeah. It's still helping to move it out. Helps to move it out, okay. yeah. You also have water, saline solutions. Bark is mucokinetic drugs. My sister had atypical pneumonia this weekend, unfortunately. She kept drinking soda. I told her to start drinking water because it helped out. She was missing me. Yeah, worse and worse. I was like, water, water helps. <laughs> water helps move everything out. Water's just good for you. It just doesn't taste very much. No, I was never a big water drinker until I got pregnant and started nursing, and then it was just that's all I want. That's why I bring this entire thing with me. I drink this entire thing over a whole day, which is how much water I'm supposed to drink. How many ounces is that? I drink a liter of Sydney Flat. Half your body weight. Half your body weight. That's good. 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 Colorless gas that is essential for sustaining for sustaining life. I would have never guessed that. Never. Is that odorless? Oxygen reverses hypoxemia. What's hypoxemia? Being without oxygen, right? Low levels of oxygen. Another respiratory agent that you really don't see out in the field very much anymore is the ammonia. I used to love ammonia. Oh. Um, ammonia is just one of those wonderful things that you can use to help differentiate between a dramatic girl and someone who is really unconscious. Last time I used ammonia, I was on scene with you at that football game where that chick was uh, unresponsive <laughs> by the amphitheater. So Chris go. broke the thing and put it in a non-rebreather and stuck it on her face. Is, is that what they use when I don't know if you're supposed to say this, but in high school, I remember the football players and the coach would like put some over their mouth, I was like, what are they sniffing? Yeah. Are they Put it in towels. <laughs> 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 I don't, I don't like to make them more alert. Like so we did. Like oh, yeah, they throw it on. That's yeah. horrible. And it stings your fingers. It's the most awful thing in the world. You have to smell it. It's horrible. But it's really good in helping arouse your patients. It helps to stimulate them to breathe. Like if you have someone who's passed out from um, intoxication and they need to be aroused and they're not arising, from a sternal rub or any other things that you might do to them. A sternal rub is really the only appropriate one to do. <laughs> um, then you would pop the spirit of ammonia and most people just take it and shove it up their nose or just put it right here in their nasal earway. And they would breathe and it would help to arouse them. They'd be very angry when they wake up. Oh yeah, nobody likes that stuff, it's horrible. It's a stimulant, it's a very noxious vapor. It stinks. It's almost like rotten eggs mixed with lots of vinegar. Yep. The best way to describe it. And this pink is bright pink. And it can burn your fingers if you get it on your fingers. So I know we use gloves. Hospitals um, still have them, but EMS services are moving away from having them because of so much um, misuse. <laughs> Wonder why. That's the uh, spirit of ammonia in a non rebreather. Or the two spirit of ammonia shoved up one person's nose. Awesome. Um, just like they tell you when you're trying to stimulate someone to use a sternal rub, don't do the nipple twist and things like that. It's just Cooey on the helicopter did that one day. <laughs> we had a guy who couldn't feel anything from the chest down. He came in and just went, you feel that? Inappropriate. All right, the next thing um, is respiratory depressants. Your opiates, of course, are going to depress your airway. What's an opiate? What's an example of an opiate? Morphine. Morphine. Morphine is an opioid that some patients have, especially your cancer patients, they take Morphine, they take it's, um, usually MS cotton or Rinoxol. I can't remember that word. Roxanol, thank you. At home for their pain management. And this can decrease their airway. What's a drug that can reverse 
opioids. Narcan. 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 Narcan is an opioid antagonist, right? You also have barbiturates that can help depress the airway. This sedative hypnotic drug has a minimal effect on blood pressure, begins working within 30 to 60 seconds. No more than one dose is ever given. It is a drug that can be used for sedation in the field. It is a precursor to succinylcholine. So you only ever give just one dose. What is? Can't give more than one dose. What, what classification is tramadol? It's a narcotic, right? No, no, it's not a narcotic. It's just um, so analgesic. Okay. okay, so it's not, it's not opiate-based. No, mm -hmm. and it makes you feel like you've taken an opioid. No so wonder that Narcan did. Yeah, no, it doesn't work. How do you know that? So this is a sedative hypnotic drug that is usually a first-line drug in RSI. Because when you do RSI, you have to sedate them first, correct? Yes. Then give the paralytic. You don't give the paralytic right away unless they're completely unconscious. They're conscious, you have to give them a sedative or hypnotic and then give them a paralytic. So this drug would be given first. Usually works very quickly, very, very, very quickly. One set amount is given and you don't have to give any more. You normally wouldn't give any more anyway in the field. You just give one dose. All right, everybody ready? Valium, metomidate, ativan, and ketamine. The correct answer is atomidate. How much atomidate do you give? Uh, six to it's like what, 0 0.2 to 0 0.6 milligram per kilogram? <laughs> standard adult dose is 20. 20 milligrams is the standard adult dose. We like to give this in the emergency room for conscious sedation. For someone who has a shoulder out of place, they'll give this atomidate to them and it will knock them right out. And they can throw that shoulder back into place. So within five, 10 minutes, they're awake. Ready to go. Ketamine is also another drug that can be given for sedation purposes prior to giving succinylcholine or vecuronium prior to an RSI. The thing about ketamine though is it can affect your blood pressure and a lot of patients, especially your pediatric patients, have adverse reactions to ketamine. Have adverse reactions to ketamine and can wind up having to spend overnight in the hospital because it can actually stop their breathing. I don't like ketamine. Ketamine is made for animals anyway. That was a veterinary medicine for a long time. It's used to help sedate animals, and now we decide to put it in the human world. I don't really like ketamine. I think it needs to belong in the veterinary world and not in the human world. Isn't it a, isn't, isn't it a big pain or analgesic in the military? Ketamine is what they use a lot. All right, what about Valium? What do you use Valium for? Feeling good. Seizures, right? Valium and Ativan are both used for their benzodiazepine, both used for seizures. Also can be used for sedation purposes for someone who is going to be getting a paralytic for RSI. So the correct answer here is atomidate. This sedative hypnotic drug causes profound disassociation and anesthesia. It can also increase their intracranial pressure and causes some degree of bronchodilation. What drug am I? Also can be a precursor for RSI. We actually just talked about it, which is kind of funny. I forgot to put the slide in here too. So this drug you would never give to a trauma patient, would you? Why? Because it causes increased Especially someone who has a head injury, because they already are probably going to have increased intracranial pressure anyway. And if this drug is going to increase it even more, you definitely don't want to give it to them. You have to RSI them. All right, everybody ready? Correct answer is ketamine. Mm. Out of any values make you happy. They don't really cause disassociation or such anesthesia. They just kind of make you happy. So benzodiazepines are the value in the Ativan that we just talked about. They are both pregnancy category D. So when do you think you would give this to a pregnant woman? Would you give it to her for sedation for RFI? No. 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 You'd probably give it to her if she's seizing though, right? Because the benefit would outweigh the risk. Because if you're seizing, are you breathing? Not breathing very adequate, are you? So your oxygen's not going to that placenta and your baby's not getting oxygen. So this person would need Valium or Ativan to help stop that seizure. When you're giving um, Valium or Ativan, another thing to remember is you have to use a lot of it if you're going to use it for sedation purposes for someone who's getting a paralytic. Those are not your first line drugs when it comes to using it for RSI. When you're doing RSI, ketamine and atomidate are used mostly. 
before you do succedylcholine. So Valium is used for sedation and hypnotic purposes if necessary, but mostly it is used for seizure control. <coughs> Ativan, same thing, mainly just used for seizure control. How much Valium do you think you give? Right off the top of your head, does anybody know? Dose of Valium? Five to ten. What about Ativan? One. One to two. Valium's five to ten, Ativan's one to two. Milligrams, that is. <laughs> you also have your chemical paralytic agents, which we're going to talk about. So acetylcholine, vecuronium, rocuronium. These are paralytic. So what does it do to the airway? Stops it. Stops it, paralyzes it. So you never want to give this to someone who's conscious, do you? You want to sedate them as best as possible with atomidate or ketamine. You want to sedate them completely, then paralyze them. Never paralyze somebody who's conscious. Okay. This drug is a depolarizing paralytic agent, has a rapid onset, onset and a brief duration. Adverse effects include hyperkalemia, bradycardia, bradycardia and elevated intraocular pressure. So you never want to give it to somebody who has glaucoma, right? Because their intraocular pressure is already increased if they have glaucoma. This is a depolarizing agent, rapid onset, brief duration. Adverse effects include increased, or increased potassium levels, low heart rate, and increased intraocular pressure. What drug am I? How would you know that high potassium level? You look you at the T-wave. T-wave on the EKG is always peaked if they've got a high potassium level. It's always what? Peaked, high, risen. Tall. Tall. <laughs> Steep. Steep. Other words for high. <laughs> Steady. I know there's 20 of y'all in here. People playing games. Uh-huh. <laughs> It's going to be bad when I take up your numbers and I say this is your quiz grade for the day. All right. Correct answer is succedylcholine. So if this has a very short duration, do you think you're going to be giving your patient something else? Yeah, they're going to require something else to keep them paralyzed. It is ultra short acting, depolarizing, skeletal muscle relaxant. It relaxes everything. It is a pregnancy category C. If your patient is conscious, you need to let them know exactly what you're fixing to do. You're going to scare the crap out of them, but let them know what you're fixing to do. You're going to have to give them some medicine to have to sedate them, and then you're going to paralyze them. If they're unconscious, you can skip the sedation. It is used for RSI. Of course, adverse reactions, it does stop your breathing, causes bradycardia. Atomidate, we already talked about atomidate. It is used to help with sedation prior to RSI. This is a pregnancy category C. Of course, it can cause a little bit of apnea. It doesn't paralyze you, it just sedates you. And anytime you're sedated or in a deep sleep, you do not breathe as adequately, correct? Right? These patients are going to need oxygen, of course. If you're doing RSI, they're going to be getting it anyway. More paralytic agents, recuronium and vecuronium. Rocuronium has a rapid onset and very short duration. Vecuronium has a long onset. Of the respiratory agents that you have available in the hospital setting, not much in the pre-hospital setting, are cough suppressants. Teslon pearls is something that you might see your patients who have COPD, bronchitis, um, emphysema. They might be on something called Teslon pearls, which if you look at it, if you've seen vitamin E, the little tan colored gels, this is what Teslon pearls look like. They're very small, thin little jelly balls. They are used for cough suppression to help to depress the coughing sensation. What antihistamine do you carry on the truck? Benadryl. Benadryl. What is histamine? 
It's a chemical meteor that's released in the body that causes what? Help fight off an antigen that you have, but it, it produces itching, hives, eukarya, third facing of fluid, right? Fluid can come out of the cells and out of the vascular space and into the interstitial space causing swelling, all right? Histamine causes fluid overload, which is why you have someone who's having an anaphylactic reaction, they have swelling, well, they don't have any fluid in their vascular space and their cells also don't have any fluid, which is why a patient in anaphylaxis can get up to four liters of fluid. It's a ton, isn't it? Wow. Even somebody tiny can get up to four liters of fluid because they have that third spacing of fluid. The histamine's released, which means they are losing fluid out of their cells, out of their vascular space, they're itching, having a bunch of hives everywhere. And that's why you give Benadryl, which is an antihistamine, which helps to block that receptor. Do you know how medicines work with a receptor site? Did y'all talk about that in advance? EMT? Yeah. How it works is a lock and key, kind of goes in there and breaks up the effects. Other allergic responses, you can have angioedema. What's angioedema? Swelling of the mouth, the lump, the mouth, the tongue, the lips, all this right here, angioedema. What medication can also cause angioedema? Ace inhibitors. Ace inhibitors, which are used for blood pressure control, cardiac medicine used for blood pressure control. Antihistamines do compete with the histamine at the receptor site, which means the antihistamines go and block that receptor site so that the histamines can't go in and cause more fluid loss or more hives. It helps to reverse that. They have an anticholinergic or an atropine-like effect. Anticholinergic just means they are running. Everything's running. They're very um, drowsy. Or excuse me, not everything's running. I apologize. It is the antidote for things that are running. Back when we talk about um, organophosphate poisonings next semester in medical management, we'll give atropine to help with that because it will help dry things up. Anticholinergic to dry you up. And that's what antihistamines are. They dry everything up. <coughs> then we'll have a local anesthetic con anesthesia effect, effect, which means Benadryl, of course, is going to make you drowsy. Sedation also helps with skin irritations. Benadryl, also known as diphyhydramine, is the most common antihistamine that you'll see. What routes can you get Benadryl? IV, IM. PO. Mostly for you, it's given IV. Does block the histamine receptor sites. It is a pregnancy category B, so it's pretty safe, right? No fetal harm has been shown in studies, so it is pretty safe. It is not used in infants. Finergan and Vistaril is also considered an antihistamine, as well as your Claritin, your Zyrtec, and your Allegra. So EMS is called to the home of a 24-year-old female complaining of shortness of breath. The patient has a history of asthma. Upon arrival, you note know they have audible wheezing and an O2 stat of 94%. Which medication can you administer as most appropriate? Dose included. Which is the correct medication and the correct dose? I'm sorry, I gotta shut this door. That food smells like that. I think it's coming from outside, isn't it? Yeah, Doesn't that make yeah, more sense? Okay. Like, like, that's the big guy can tell. It actually reminds me of Thanksgiving dinner. And right now that's how I'm feeling. Making me hungry. Miss Brandon. I'm fixing to puke out that window. Yeah. It's probably coming through hey, the window. Oh, uh, it's coming from out there. It's bad. It smells like cookies. It smells like ham. It's like bacon. Ham, cookies, it's all the same. Hey, but if you don't want the window, it won't be a red spot anymore. <laughs> All right, the correct answer is albuterol 2.5 milligrams, which is how many milliliters? 0 0.5 milliliters. EMS is called to the home of an 18-year-old male complaining of hives and itching from poison oak. The patient is not having difficulty breathing, so he's having a very mild allergic reaction, right? So he's having a very mild allergic reaction. Which medication is most appropriate? Okay. 
Give him the D. Give him the D. You feel better, Leah? Somebody really gave him the D. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the correct answer is Benadryl, 25 milligrams. The dosage, I believe, of Benadryl is what, 10 to 50? Mm. No, it air gives 10. It's always 25 or 50. You get five for a pretty severe allergic reaction, which you're giving epinephrine with as well. But for a mild allergic reaction, 25 milligrams of Benadryl is sufficient to give IV. What's wrong with this epinephrine dose on C? One in 1,000? That's supposed to be one in 1,000. Sub Q, all right? It's 0.1 to 0.3, 1 to 1,000 sub Q. But for a severe allergic reaction, you can give epinephrine IV. Did you know that? Which one, one can you give IV? 1 in 10. 1 in 10,000. The dose of D is correct for um, 1 to 10,000, not 1 to 1,000. You give, give 1 milligram of 1 to 1, 000, 1 to 10,000 IV. If you give a milligram of 1 in 1,000 IV, their heart would like you to kill somebody. Been done. Paul? <laughs> three three to five now. milligrams. Boom. All right. Trash? Is that slander? No. <laughs> 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 Thank you. All right. You were called the home of a 65 year old male who has COPD. He's not responding well to the CPAP machine. He's not responding well to the COPD. He's not responding well to the CPAP machine. And Med Control orders you to RSI him. Which medication is most appropriate to give first? All right. Your patient is responsive. So you got to sedate him first, right? As you hint. He has COPD. He needs sedation. Oh, crap. I hit the wrong button. Prior to getting a paralytic. So which medication would you give that's the correct dose? Another thing, make sure you get the correct dose. If you press the button and then you decide to change it, you press another button, does it change your answer? Yes. Oh, okay, good. Tell my husband that home sick today. My son keeps lighting up with Josh McCoy shared this link. <laughs> my husband is a Republican all the way. Strict gun right. Yeah, America. And it's like every other post thing that blows up my phone. He's done shared something else. I'm like, well, he's going to get to kill one day. <laughs> or not. Hey, he's hardcore second in the right, which I have no problem with because we, we both are but He's just kind of funny. If you've ever met my husband, he's very quiet, reserved. He doesn't talk very much. But he'll put a bullet in you real quick. But man, he will draw that. He is adamant. He is a pistol carrier. He would, he would carry two, I think. If, if he could. If he could. <laughs> one on the belt and one on the boot. <laughs> <laughs> he tried to open his carry the other day. I'm like, Josh, please don't. Please don't open carry. Please just conceal like you always do. <laughs> I mean, he carries his gun at church. He carries his gun everywhere. I feel like I get along with your husband. It's a perfectly good thing. What if somebody comes up in your church and disrupts your Jesus time? Might have to put him down. That's why you don't see all these people get shot in Alabama. We just blow their head off. Yeah, we'll shoot back. We have an arsenal in our house. We are like four cops here. We're good to go. We're good to go. Somebody's carrying about to go to Israel. Yeah, we're good to go. 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 we in school? In you my mouth. You got to go in school? No. That's recording, Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's look at this. 61% of you got it correct. The correct answer is Atomidate. The normal adult dose is 20 milligrams IV. It is what, what do we say, 0.2 to 0.6 milligrams per kilogram? But a normal adult dose is 20 milligrams of Atomidate IV. Now, you give that to someone who needs sedation before you give them a paralytic. Always a conscious patient. What would be the reason why you wouldn't give ketamine? Because the, I, the trauma. Trauma. The it's a head trauma, right? Never give it to a head trauma okay. patient because it would cause an increase in the cranial pressure. Mm. Any questions? Is our quiz coming from this? Or is it going to be all of the respiratory drugs? It is. It's coming from this and any other respiratory drugs that I might have left out. I don't think I left any out, did I? I don't think so. I don't think I did. Oh. Uh -oh. okay. I don't think I did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I am human. I might have left something out, but I don't think I did. We'll let you know what that did. I've been working on this since I had the 
blue, so there's no telling. Yeah, to don't worry. If we don't agree with your test, we'll let you know. <laughs> oh, I know you don't. So. All right, let me end this real quick.